I'm delighted to be here. Some of you know me as a, uh, really not by my name, but as Celeste's husband <laughs> or Celestia's father. For those that do know me, uh, you can call me Brother Paige, Brother Frank, Frank, and I was always taught it's not what you call them, but what you answer to. So, they messed up this morning because one, they gave me a hands free mic. Oh, I love these things. When you're not used to using them, they're excited. So, I always like to start off to see if you all want to follow me this morning. And I talked to my daughter, and she said, Dave, you always tell a joke. I said, Yes, I do. So, I'm going to tell you a joke. Uh, and you know it's a good joke because anytime a joke starts with, There I was. So, there I was. A few years ago, we're in uh, Washington, we were doing some training in the mountains, and prior to us going out there, they told us that, hey, there's bears. And when you see the bears, avoid the bears. So, we're in groups of two, we're walking through, um, I'm with this guy, first time I met him, and he's talking, and we begin to talk about the Bible. And he tells me, well, I don't believe in God. Earth. Okay, you don't believe in God? No. I'm telling them how God saves and how Jesus came to, to give us life and to save us. And he's like, I don't believe in that. And I said, well, do you have a Bible? He said, I don't believe that. So we're walking through it. We hear, oh! So my philosophy is, I just want to know which way you run so I can go the opposite way. <laughs> and so we, he decided to follow me. Don't ask me why. <laughs> He follows me, we run, but what happens? Run! We run right into the bear. Back then, I was a little faster. That's all I'm saying on that. So I get a little ahead of him, and the bear captures him. And then he says, oh, Lord, please save me. And it was like time stopped. We're sitting there, and I'm looking at him. And we hear the voice of God. And the voice of God says, oh, now that you're in trouble, you need me to save you. But when you weren't in trouble, you didn't need me. Now you want to call on me. And he says, Lord, I just want you to make this bear a Christian bear. <laughs> Y'all know where I'm going. God said, ask and ye shall receive. Then it's like, poof, the lightning, everything. And all of a sudden, it's like the bear started raising up on his hind legs and he's standing over him. And then the bear says, Father, thank you for this food that I am about to receive. <laughs> Everybody that laughs at it wrong, thank you all wrong. <laughs> yeah, let me pray. Father God, I just want to thank you this morning, Lord. Lord, I want to thank you for just your word. Lord, I just ask that the Spirit would use me this morning as I teach your word. Lord, I just ask that if there's anyone here under the sound of my voice, Lord, that has not received you, and Lord, that doesn't understand the greatest gift that you've given us, Lord, I ask that something that I say that you've given me would touch them and change their heart. It's in your Son, Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right. So, this morning, uh, staying in line with what Pastor had called under construction. Uh, I thought about this message when he talked to me, and it was something that, uh, that's been placed in my heart for a long time. And especially after this, this recent incident that happened in um, UNC Charlotte in North Carolina. And my heart goes out for situations like that for all parties because something happens in a person's life that changes them to make them want to do something like that. And I began to think, you know, what part does the church play in that? You know, when those individuals were younger, were they given an opportunity to come into the church and when they came in, were they accepted? You know, did the church reach out and show them compassion? And when I, I'm talking to the universal church. Did we teach them that, hey, 
It doesn't matter, you know, how quirky you are or um, how nerdy you may be perceived or whatever, but that God still accepts us. And I wonder if that took place. So this message and, and the title is Compassion. And I'm going to take a quick break to tell you why the title is called Compassion. Uh, with a subtitle, Accepting People As They Are or As Is. Um, this past Thursday, Wednesday, well Thursday, our AC had been down for like a week at the house. Thank God it wasn't 95 degrees or anything like that. Um, and I think it was Wednesday, one day before the God was coming, it had been down for about five days. And my wife looks to me, I have permission to tell the story. I told her, I'm going to make it a little better, but I do have permission. And she says, she's like, you know, I don't see how you can stay in this house like that. And I'm like, so I go read the meter. You know, I'm like, okay, well, I still have the AC on, the fan is going, bought another little fan. I go read the meter, I'm like, okay, what's It's only 81 degrees. That's not hot. Windows are open and everything. And she says, you have no compassion. Just like that. And I said, what do you mean I have no compassion? I said, baby, look, I accept the things as they are. When we were in the desert, and those that have been in the desert, it's 127 degrees. What do you do? You go lay down. You get your bottle of water and you lay down. Now, my wife, is a, she was a former soldier. So I'm thinking, baby, you got to embrace it. You have to accept it. She said, you have no compassion. And so that brought the title of this message, Compassion. Not that I didn't have any compassion for her, but as she said, I was being insensitive. So our scripture this morning comes out of Romans 15, uh, verses 4 through 7. And I'll read. For every, and I'll read out of the NIV. It says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we may have hope. We might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that one mind and one voice may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then here's the key verse. Accept one another, then just as Christ accepted you in order to, be, to bring praise to God. Accept one another, then just as Christ accepted you, in order to be in praise to God. Now, you know, this light is hot, so you're going to see why Pastor brings his town, don't worry. I brought mine too. Now, I'm going to minister this morning briefly. Uh, I told the deacons that this will be a very short message. I'm going to hit the point, and then we'll be out here by 3 o'clock. We won't be here long. <laughs> now, I just want to take some time on this subject. We're going to have a good time. We'll talk about this word, and you all, and I'm going to give you an example um, out of the Bible. Because if you don't know, like I, I said one time before, when I read the Bible, I put on what's called my spiritual goggles. And what they do, they allow me to, to place myself in there. And if you ever, how many reality TV, TV people, or reality, how many people here watch reality TV? We in church now. Okay, there we go. I see the hand coming up now. So, the Bible actually was the first reality TV because of the stories. And I'm going to give you an example of one as we go through and we talk about this. But first, I want to give you the, the, the definition that I looked up. Compassion, sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings and misfortunes of others as is in the existing circumstances. Now, when I was studying for this message, what I realized in preparing it and looking at the situations around the world and in life, we have only two things that we convey to people when we're talking to them. It's either we accept you or we reject you. 
a lot of times we as Christians, and I say we, I'm talking about myself as well, we teeter on the side of rejection more than we do acceptance. Because someone doesn't look like us, they don't talk like us, um, they don't wear the same clothes that we wear, they're not from the same part of town. But the truth of the matter is, when people are hurting, you cannot reject them. When people are hurting, we have to reach inside ourselves, reach inside our heart, and then we have to touch them where they are, in the circumstances that they are. Too often we try to go in and change them or make them conform to who we are without looking at the circumstances and going to the foundation. Now, I say that because this is a new, it is a new topic. Um, yes, I've talked about some things that, that um, I've said before because I spoke about this topic because it really does something to me on the inside, and this is me. When I see people who cannot fend for themselves for whatever reason getting taken advantage of or being hurt, it does something to me. As a church, it should do something to all of us. Because the Bible tells us, if you read the scriptures before this text, it tells us that we who are stronger are supposed to take care of the weaker. When we don't do that, we're saying, look, I quote and I can say what God tells me to say, but my actions don't show it because I'm rejecting you. But when the Bible says that you should not do that. So, I'm going to give you a quick illustration. And I'm going to talk about something um, here because it's two things. And I give you the choice. You tell me which one you want to know about. I can tell you a quick illustration about a car, recent car I bought. I can tell you about a shirt I bought a while ago. Shirt. Car. 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 <laughs> he said shirt. Car. 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 Okay. Car is. Car. What's that? So. Man, I had the wrong shirt. Uh, car. So, I buy this car. Because I said, I just need a truck to, the uh, truck SUV to put uh, mulch and stuff like that. It didn't want anything spectacular. Uh, and if you know me, those that do know me, uh, I do not like to spend money. Uh, I like a deal. I really do. If, if it says um, clearance, and then past clearance, you know, post clearance, final sale, you never gonna bring it back. Well, that's where I go. <laughs> because that's gonna be a good deal. So I buy this car, right? First mistake was I bought it at night. Okay, so it's all clean, you know, the wheels are armored all brand new tires, this, that, that. I get in it, boom, I'm driving home, coming, you know, I'm not gonna take home coming from nothing like that, because then you know, I'll trace it down. But it wasn't in the price. So I'm driving home, it's driving good. I'm like, man, I got to deal on this truck. Man, I get home the next day, I start it up. Okay, boom. I didn't know what, I'm going to drive it for a rucker. Drive it for a rucker. Man, the dashboard lit up like it was Christmas in March. <laughs> Every light on the dashboard just at one point said, boop, boop, boop. The car started sputtering. I said, oh, man. Now I got some, some mechanical inclination about myself, so I pull out my little thing, I connect it up, I read the code, I said, oh, it's just a spark plug. I mean, by the way, it said as is. And when you read the signs where it says as is, it says any deals, you have to talk to the people. Spoken promises are not, uh, don't lie, gotta be written. It didn't even flip over in that back of that paper, and then it tells you, as is, once you take it off this lot, you own it. The problems are yours. What if people came with an as is? What if when you went to get your spouse? Like, not yet. You met your spouse. <laughs> and your spouse, because your spouse comes as is. You accept your spouse with all flaws, uh, knowing that 
the years to come, a hell of a lot of hair. You're going to lose hair. You may not wear the same clothes size. Um, you may be different. What if we looked at people the same way we looked at used cars? We'll accept merchandise, cars and clothes and things like that, sometimes more readily than we will accept people. Knowing that people have flaws, irregularities, they're not perfect. We know what happened to the one perfect man who walked the earth. We have to quit looking for perfection in people. No one is perfect. We have to begin to accept people for who they are, what they are, as is. Knowing that, hey, the same way God is working on me is the same way that he's working on you and the next person. Amen? All right. Uh, some of you have seen this. I gave y'all the card. I don't know, I'm going to show y'all this, this right here, right? So, because I brought this in. This is a visual aid. <laughs> so, I bought this shirt a few years ago. This is real quick. And I get it home. You know, because back in the day, the stores, you had the clearance in the behind that you had. So, and, and Pam, you've seen this before. Yeah. So, this was my shirt, right? I get it home. I put it on. And I'm like, I always wanted a gray shirt. One sleeve was smaller than the other. <laughs> <laughs> so I kept, I kept it, and I'm going to take the staples out. I'll wear it. But I'll wear a jacket over it. I just don't take the jacket on. <laughs> Look, that's the even true story. This is, my wife will tell you I'm a mess, OK? <laughs> What I'm talking about compassion, though, what I want you to understand is that there are no perfect people. But as we're under construction, as the church is being, as Pastor is saying, we're being rebuilt from the, from the ground up, compassion actually indicates that we're a strong church. See, when we step outside of these four walls and we begin to affect the community around us, that has an impact not only on this local community, but it has an impact on the nation. On the world, and we have to look at that. We have to, to you know, quit judging people and and hoping that they will be more like us. When understanding that God made every last one of us unique and different. Amen. The word says we have a responsibility for it. Now, I told you I was going to take this to reality TV. Uh, this one right here, this episode. It's coming out of Luke chapter 7. And we're going to look at this scripture real quick. And like I said, I'm going to be done in a few seconds, a few minutes. And I like to call this the troubled lady versus the Pharisee. When you look at <coughs> Luke 7, and I'm going to read the scripture. Or I'll, I'll paraphrase it because I think the scripture is going to come up on the screen. Script the take, I'll tell you if it's so cool. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I, look, I'm loving this, okay? I, there, there's churches that I speak at sometimes that doesn't have the technology, and so when you have the technology, I can move from this side to That's the commercial break. Squirrel moment, I'm back. I'm back. I'm sorry. Okay, squirrel moment, I'm back. But let's look at the scripture. I like to call this the troubled lady versus the Pharisee. When we look at this scripture, uh, and we're going through it. One of the Pharisees had invited Jesus to his house. Um, the Bible says Jesus was kind at the table. He was just sitting there. Now, it was customary at that time. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. Wow. Just think if people would come where they knew Jesus was. That's just a, a quick break. As she stood behind him at his feet, and this is not a, a new story weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on him. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, this is where reality TV comes in. 
You know, you think of some of those, they always got the, the, the one who stirs up the mess and calls the prophet. He says, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Wow, that, that's deep. You got a sinner calling another sinner a sinner. Deep. I'm telling you, if you get into this and you start pulling it out, wow. Jesus answered him. Now this right here would have paused me right where I was at. Because he says, Simon, I have something to tell you. Jesus heard his thoughts. The whisper. I would be scared at this point right now. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owe money to a certain money limit. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, and I like his answer, because his answer was kind of snide to get it. I suppose the one who had the bigger debt, forgive <coughs> Jesus, with the boldness of the word, said, you have judged correctly. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sin? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Five minutes or less. What you see right here is the greatest, one of the greatest stories of compassion. Jesus walked in. Every other person who walked into Simon's house was given the traditional kiss on the cheek, their feet were washed, but Jesus was treated almost like a mechanic when he came in, less than the others. He was not afforded that because they were looking down on him, not really knowing who he was, nor the power that existed inside of him. So as they go on, he reads the thoughts. He reads his mind. And Jesus corrects him. Not with a, a, a malicious attitude or anything like that. Jesus corrects him with the word in a loving manner. Because there's still hope for Pharisees or those who believe they're Pharisees. There's still hope to transform. But then we look at this woman, and I call her the troubled lady because of her past life. And truth be told, we all got a past life. 20, 30 years from now, I mean, before you are today, like I tell the kids, don't look at me for who I am today, because who I am today was not who I was 30 years ago. But I had to go through my things to get to where I'm at, the same as everyone else. But a lot of times when we go to our closet, we open it up and the bone, whoop, kick that bone back in because I can't let anybody see it. We all have things in our past that may hinder us if we allow it. And we can't and we cannot continue to, to look at people for those things in their past life or who they was. You know, something that when I was growing up, uh, you know, when you're dating, and some of y'all might know this, um, you break, you, you, you say, hey, you tell your parents, look, I got a girl, you know, talking to, I don't know what they call it today, but we call it talking. I'm talking to this young lady. And the first thing that we had, what would your parents ask? No, who are people? That's what they would ask. Who's the people? And then they would begin to, oh, well, I know them, and this is what they did. I know them, oh, you don't wanna, you don't wanna be with them because they did this. She ain't got nothing to do, well, she had nothing to do with what her parents or her brothers and her, her uncles and stuff did. It was about her at that time really liking me. And that's important. 
because she was like me. And I was accepting her for who she was, not for who her parents were, or who her uncles were, or what they had done. Now, this is what the Pharisee Simon was doing at this time. Looking at this lady for what she was, not understanding that, guess what? When Jesus said, you are forgiven, he had the power, the only one that had the power to say that and to do that, and forgave her on the spot. And then the Pharisees looked, hmm. That's how we do sometimes. Everyone who comes in here is a child of God. Whatever door they come in this house of worship, they are a child of God. When we go outside these walls, we see children of God. We see them walking up and down the street. They come to us. We are obligated to show compassion. We are obligated to show them the same love that Jesus showed us. And if we have a problem doing that, then we need a whole Bible sense to just talk about compassion and what it means for us to do that as a, as a nation, as a country. Because if we don't start embracing those who feel unembraced, what we're seeing, you know, it's fine to talk about right. He was a Hebrew from North Carolina. But we're talking about him while he's not here anymore. We have to begin to, to, to just embrace people and no longer look at ways to reject them. And that's, that's my message today. You know, when I spoke here on um, the Good Friday service, I said that the message from the cross is all about love. When they hung Jesus, he had his arms wide open to receive us and accept us. There's no greater love. And what we saw in UNC Charlotte was one of the examples of that. Because as he rushed the shooter, he gave his life so others could live. Amen? Now, I told Pastor I was going to close at about three. But I'm actually at the close of my message. I told you, I, I'm. When you get the points across, Karen, and just bring them up. These are the only points that I have for today. And when you look at those, the biggest thing that I want you to understand is that no matter who you are, no matter what you do, no matter what status you have in life, where you live, whether it's this side of the or that side, Jesus accepts us all. And that as ambassadors and heirs to this all, as kingdom-minded people. Kingdom-minded people. We have to do the same thing. Because in the Word, and I, I have this final scripture, Matthew 6, 15 says, But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins.